This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make lightning protection easy. If your wind turbines are due for maintenance or repairs, install our Strike Tape Retrofit LPS upgrade at the same time. A Strike Tape installation is the quick, easy solution that provides a dramatic, long lasting boost to the factory lightning protection system. Forward thinking wind site owners install Strike Tape today to increase uptime tomorrow. Learn more in the show notes of today's podcast. Welcome back. I'm Alan Hall. I'm Dan Blewett, and this is the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about wind energy, engineering, lightning protection, and ways to keep your wind turbines running. All right, welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, we've got a great guest, Chris Cheshlack of Blade Bug is here. And I'm also joined by my co-host, Alan Hall. Alan, how are you, sir? Hey, great, Dan. Boy, Chris uh, brings a lot of information to the table during this episode. And it's really interesting to hear all the robot technology that they've been working on over in the UK. Yeah, so uh, Chris is the founder of Bladebug and a former uh, blade design engineer with, with Festus and some others. And so he's got a lot of, uh, lot of technical know-how about you know, winter and blade design. And so when they went out to create a robotic solution, you know, he decided that, uh, you know, a vacuum independent leg moving, honestly, kind of like a crawling critter, that's, you know, <laughs> why they're called blade bug, blade bug um, was their solution. It's a really interesting technology and they can do a lot of things that uh, some of the other robotics companies won't be able to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just hearing him go into depth about some of their solutions and the technology and uh, the redundancy and just so there's a lot of interesting things that go into such a high tech prototype. It, it is uh, a very difficult uh, event that they're trying to do. Right. So they're, they're going to try to go out on physical on a blade, particularly offshore and do all kinds of either measurements or repair procedures on a blade. That's a very difficult problem to try to solve. But I, I think you know, they've taken several years to develop this technology, and I, I think that's one of the benefits to where they're at today is that they spent all the hard work and time of evolving to the space they're at now and to the robot they have now, because without spending those years in development, you, you don't have a really qualified robot, in my opinion, and that you don't have something you can really deploy and be reliable. And they've gone through all those early learning pains that, that uh, most startup companies do, and now they're at a stage where they're going to really be deploying robots and the technology is really good. And I, I think they've shown themselves to be um, a, a really reliable platform that, that, and that is also adaptable to all kinds of tools. So this is a really interesting interview and it, it, there's a lot of great information just about the robot and its technology, but also about the business aspect of it and where the company is headed. So it's a it's a really nice interview. Yeah, I mean, and, and they were incubated by, and they, and they still are uh, in partnership with ORE Catapult, which is the incubator out in Scotland. And just to hear their influence and how it's helped them, you know, get on actual turbines and, and, and do testing in real world conditions. And just how important that is to getting, uh, you know, from the design to the prototype to the, you know, everyday use uh, scenario. That's such an important part. And that can be such a, a really difficult jump. Uh, you know, like when yeah. we, you yeah. know, in previous podcasts, like everyone talks about just how, you know, they need to have, you know, is this, is this solution what customers want? You know, is this solution going to be viable? It, you know, we need to test this in real world, you know, scenarios, but it can be challenging for the owners of these, you know, multi, multi-million dollar wind farms to let people, you know, try it out essentially on their turbine, even when the technology is proven and they had a great last 12 months, you know, doing their first walk back in the fall. You know, and, and it looks like they have a lot, you know, they have a busy summer coming up here as well of, of real world testing. So, so yeah, I mean, it's just a, a really interesting evolution for their business. And the ORE catapult, I think, is unique in a sense because they're so focused on their uh, wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, and the and United Kingdom, and, and particularly up in Scotland, is there's just going to be a, a plethora of wind turbines being installed over the, in the next couple of years. And they needed to develop their own internal framework to support that and all the uh, all the pieces around just putting the turbines out to off off 
into the sea out there. And it's a unique situation that Ori Catapult is in and, and, the, and the services that, that they provide. We In the United States, we don't really have such a setup. So you're right, Dan. In a sense, a smaller company has a, with great technology has a very difficult time to try to get to uh, an, an OEM or a large operator because there's just so many layers of, well, bureaucracy, sort of. But also, um, it's very hard to, to, to sort of break those barriers, particularly during COVID times because no one's in the office. So, uh, you mm-hmm. know, already Catapult provides a very, very special service and, and can accelerate a company like Bladebug, which is what they're there to do. So I, I think Bladebug's in a very unique position is that they have access to uh, OEMs, but also an access to a, a development turbine where they can try out uh, the different things about the robot. So it's a it's a unique uh, it's a unique experience and a unique time for both uh, offshore wind in the UK and for Bladebug. Yeah. So without further ado, we're going to jump to our conversation with Chris Cheshlack of Bladebug. All right. Well, Chris, thanks so much for joining us on the show. We're excited to, to chat with you about Bladebug. How's everything out there in the UK? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Thank you f- um, for hosting me and, and for allowing us to talk about Bladebug. So we're going to jump right into it. I mean, we're excited to talk about uh, what is really a, a unique robot. Obviously, there's a couple robotics companies um, trying to tackle inspections and repair, but you have a really unique model. You, you know, your your blade bug robot is one that's not cable driven. Um, you know, it's got vacuum independent legs. So can you talk to us about the current model? Um, how you got there and, and some of the technology, um, you know, that it's, it's taking up to these, you know, huge, uh, wind turbine blades. Yeah, I'd love to. So just to set the scene a little bit, I've got a background as a a wind turbine blade designer. I spent a number of years designing blades and have an understanding of how they're um, manufactured and and problems can go wrong with them. And it was actually taking that experience and understanding that there is, um, there hasn't been much improvement in, in blade maintenance over the years, apart from the advancement of drones, for which have been really good at sort of performing, you know, the vision inspections. But when it comes down to the detailed inspections and, and the repairs, it still relies very heavily on, you know, manual um, rope access technicians. And I felt there was a better way of doing it, especially as they're getting large, especially offshore turbines, they're getting larger and further from shore. And the reliance on, on human intervention, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's going to, become more and more challenging. So um, we've come up with a very novel concept. And as you mentioned, it's it's got multiple legs. We've got six legs with multiple degrees of freedom. And we use vacuum to attach ourselves to the surface of the blade. And what these multiple legs afford us to do is it enables us to conform and adapt to the changing shape of the blade from the root, which is a large cylinder, right down to the tip, which is a very small aerofoil. So we can be in very close contact with the blade everywhere and so this allow, enables us to do very detailed inspections so um if you have your drone inspection and there's some ambiguous footage we can go there we can get very clear steady footage from that but then we can go beyond that because we're in close contact so we can do your very detailed inspections using techniques such as ultrasonic non-destructive testing to look at damage beneath the surface and then actually whilst we're there we can also do repairs so it's it's We've developed a robot that is really adaptable and flexible, um, not just in terms of what it can physically do, but also what it can actually achieve on the on the, the blade. So, it's inspection, maintenance, and repair device to to tackle uh, you know a variety of problems that you will see on blades uh, during their lifetime in service. I think it's something as we look up at these wind turbines, we don't take. I think we take for granted that the the blade is actually kind of complex in the shape right it twists slowly as it goes towards the end um like you said like you look up at these things and they're huge and you think that's just kind of like a surfboard i think is like the easy way to for like an outsider to say oh like just you know some wings but um what what kind of so is it just adhering to the blade if you were you know using like tracks or i mean what were other what what were other prototypes or, or other design conceptions or concepts that maybe just like wouldn't have worked because of the changing? I mean, why did you settle on independent legs? I mean, I'm sure there are lots of different ways to design a robot that could potentially do something, but you settled on your current design after lots and lots of iterations, right? Yeah, that's correct. So it didn't it didn't start off as a as a multi legged robot walking blade surfaces. So I think one of the earliest concepts I came up with was um, a wheel with vacuum cups. So the idea being that it would be a wheeled vehicle 
that would have suction sticking to it as it rotates along the surface. But there are problems with that time in turning the vacuum on and off. Um, we then looked at a more conventional track device. So there's lots of sort of Caterpillar track devices that are used for, say, mm-hmm. pipe inspections. And so integrating a vacuum system onto that. But what really came down to uh, um, deciding on the hexapod or the, the multi-legged robot was its ability to adapt and conform to all the different parts. So we can straddle a leading edge. And not only that, once we're there, we can use that dexterity to control the body in a way that you would require a separate um, multiple degree of freedom arm that you see on, on other robotic devices to perform tasks. So we don't actually have to have separate elements to perform tasks on a blade. We can use the robot to perform, you know, a scanning sweep or, you know, to activate your uh, lightning protection system probe onto the receptor. We don't need any separate devices. So it was a very complex system to develop. Um, and by making it complex, it, it, there's been challenges. But what we've ended up doing is making a very complex system that's very easy to use. So we have a simple um, joystick approach. We just have a controller. The robot does all the clever scanning and, and, and calculates where to place its feet. And the operator, you know, navigates it left, right, forward and back. And it's a very simple um, device to use once it's actually on the blade. Yeah, so you guys had uh, some big news, obviously, in the end of 2020. So you guys had your first ever walk. Um, up on the, um, I guess that's a, you know, it's a functioning wind turbine, but it's, uh, you know, what would you call it? It's more of like a test turbine. Is that the the way that they describe it with the the ORE catapult? Yeah, I think they they term it as like a demonstrator turbine. So it's it's a place where people can demonstrate new technology. Um, but it's it's a big seven megawatt offshore turbine, but it's it's as near shore as you can get. So it's about twenty meters from the shore, connected via a bridge, which is fantastic because we don't need to worry about get into sight which is fantastic um and it's big it, it, the blades are sort of 83 and a half meters it's a big big turbine and so to be able to demonstrate uh, the capabilities on that is fantastic for us it really validates what we're doing in the most r- realistic um scenario that we could possibly get so um so that's right. Towards the end of t- last year, we did that as our first major blade walk. And actually, just last week, we were back there again and we performed our first uh, lightning protection system check on the blade. We did a full blade walk and we've got some excellent sort of footage and data from that, which was, yeah, it was great to be back there and see the progression that we've made o- again over the course of winter and during another lockdown um, mm-hmm. and the challenges of that everyone's been facing for COVID. So it's been really exciting to get back out there. Um, the weather gods were on our side and we had some beautiful weather for three days and we got lots of great um, data to to progress the robot going forward as well. So when when you're going through different uh, testing stages and different prototypes, are you testing it on like increasingly concept or uh, complex services? Like did you test, you know, robot variation one on just like a flat surface and if it can do that then you go on or did you kind of go from complex surfaces at the beginning trying to maybe weed out a design that was never going to work how, how does that process work I'm, I'm pretty interested to hear you know because it seems like you could go lots of different ways where if you could if you get stuck with a design that does really well with just a flat surface it just might never as you scale up or as you continue to evolve with it it might not work when you have to, like you said that complex twisting changing design on a blade yeah, and that's that's very accurate for what we encountered when we were doing our development. So we started off on flat surfaces because working in an office, that's what you have. And so we started mm-hmm. with a basic with a basic hexapod with vacuum cups. And then when you start walking around, you realize that it's not a normal hexapod. The fact that your feet are adhered to the surface and they're not able to slip and slide and you've basically constrained it in a way which robots aren't normally constrained you have to overcome certain difficulties and that gets amplified when you're walking on um, the highly complex geometries of a wind turbine blade so we've had to do some very novel uh approaches to our design to overcome these challenges and so we did start off with flat but very quickly um have been testing on curved surfaces so we've we've made lots of mock-up surfaces within the office just to make sure that actually it's not limited to a, a surface type and we've we've got a solution now where we have a, a constant walking speed over flat to highly curved surfaces without any problems whatsoever 
so on the on the blade surface itself, I know different uh, blade manufacturers use different kinds of of coatings and and leading edge protections and a variety of different surface textures. How does that influence the robot and the vacuum and and the movement of the robot? How do you how do you overcome those things? The cups that we use are relatively standard industrial cups that are able to conform and adapt to quite a lot of surface irregularities. So, um, for example, during our development of our walking, before we uh, um, ventured onto a blade on that turbine, we did trials on a on a tower section um, that the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult have in their facilities in Blythe. And we were able to walk down the outside of a tower. So we were having to go across um, weld seams and bolted flanges, and the cups were able to conform and adapt very well to those. So we don't really have any issues as such. There are, you know, if there are big discontinuities or something like that, there could be a problem. But the way that the robot logic works, you know, we can sense what each cup is doing. And if one cup, for example, doesn't have vacuum, we can either make a decision call to, or it can make a decision call whether to continue if it's safe to do so, or just to readjust that foot and, you know, go, okay, that one isn't quite good. So I'm gonna move it to another place and, and carry on its walking gait as such. It's, the robot has the intelligence inside of it, and this is different than a lot of other sort of platforms that we've seen in that a lot of times the operator is making all the decisions and how the robot, quote unquote, robot moves up and down. And in your case, you've actually made your robot intelligent, so it can find its next footing. So the, the operator itself just says, I need to get to point B, and the robot really figures it out step by step is that how how it works internally in the robot we're not quite there yet so it, we, we term it as a, a semi-autonomous device in the sense that yes that we have a joystick and we press forward and the robot automatically knows where to place its feet and adjust to the changing curvatures um there probably is some manual intervention with things uh like this surface discontinuity but it's something that we will be incorporating that logic and that sort of intelligence into it as we go on sure and one of the big questions we hear a lot about from the wind community about robots uh, adhering to the blade is the, uh, the the comment that, well, my blades are dirty and well, my blades have salt on them. Does that influence the, the ability of the, of the robot to stay attached? And you're, you've been testing it at Cat or Catapult, which is offshore, which there is a lot of salt. Is, have you yeah. seen any issues with that? We haven't. And in fact, it, it, it's, it's been working extremely well. You know, we haven't seen every eventuality on on a blade, but what we do see sure. is that we do see a build up on the cups, but it doesn't affect um, their performance. And we have been doing a lot of testing throughout. So um, when it started off being designed, we sort of started with the vacuum cups up and we did a lot of tests with salt spray and, and you know, working on blades that sure. have been left out in the environment for a long, long time and sure. were in terrible condition. Yeah. So we, we, we're confident that actually the cups work and what is most likely to happen is the vacuum system will need a sort of a purge every now and then to clean it from, you know, if it, if it has, has any sort of salt build up within oh, it. But sure. We haven't seen any detrimental sure. problems at all. Wow, that's 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 amazing because the the complexity of of this problem seems so enormous. Just being an outsider looking at that problem, and it's I, I've watched your company sort of progress over the last year or so, and it's amazing. It's quite amazing that you can actually climb that blade in this in these rough conditions because I I think that's probably one of the the biggest question marks out there is how does this actually work? And you've demonstrated it successfully multiple times now, um, so that that's a really good foundation to start with. Yeah, no, it's very encouraging to see for sure. And and so let's talk a little bit more about the vacuum because um, obviously, even if the you know it's a, a low wind day and and you know the blades are obviously going to be shut down, so nothing's going to be moving, but it's still a pretty rough environment. Um, how much vacuum? Like, do all six legs have to be firmly planted for it to be you know stable and and stay up there? I mean, how many legs can come off or be off at any one time, and the robots stay on the blade? At this stage of development, like safety is probably our, our main priority. So we always try and maintain at least three points of contact with the blade. So we, with each vacuum cup on a, on a sort of tripod walking gate in contact with vacuum achieved. So um, one of the nice things that we've designed within the robot is, is a completely independent vacuum system. So each leg is independent from the other. So if one has a problem, um, for example, if it walks on a crack and, and there's leaks, um, we can we can see you know is that leak severe enough that it's going to cause a problem? But actually, two legs are sufficient to to continue the progress. So um, we haven't 
really tested it in vain. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've been extremely cautious at the moment, but, you know, we, we don't need to have, you know, all three legs down at one point uh, to be a, to, to have safe sort of motion on the blade. I love to, I love to hear that design because it's a very aerospacious design, I'll call it, because it's redundant. And that's exactly what you, you need out there. I know a, a lot of earlier robots that we have seen don't seem to have any redundancy in them. Uh, they're like single point failures all over the design. Your design is redundant and robust, which makes it much more reliable. And I think that's a huge advantage for your design technique. Thank you. And it's it's not, it's, it's, it probably gets even more um, safety critical when you think, actually, if you do have a failure on a leg, you can change your walking gait. So it's four down and two up. You don't have to stick with a tri. So it's very adaptable in how it walks. You're not limited to a certain walking style. If, if you come across problems wow. or if you find that actually you do need more purchase on the blade than, than the three legs can give you, you can increase that yeah. and still continue your movement. That's amazing. And is that something you just learned from experience? It just sounds like, hey, we ran into that problem. Here's how we fix it. And you that's what it sounds like. Is that how it happened? Yeah. Is there is there a handbook for designing right. a brand new robot that's never existed before? <laughs> yeah. Well, we weirdly we did find a book about robotics for offshore wind turbine blade inspection and repair, which was quite useful for this project. But um, no, it is a kind of it was a. I think it, when the, when the design was being conceived, that was always in the back of the mind to have that redundancy in, in place. Um, and just being aware that, you know, you're in a very hostile environment, you know, we're, we're going to be providing these to robots, to customers, you don't want them to fail, you know, you need to have that confidence that it's going to be able to achieve the task that it's sent out there to do. And so having that sort of redundancy designed in from the beginning has, has kind of always been at the forefront of, of the engineers um, developing it mindset, really. And, and each leg has its own vacuum system, right? So it's, you know, there's not like, you know, you spring a leak and the whole system goes out, but they all have their own ind independent one, right? That's correct. Yes. And so each leg is independent vacuum. We monitor the vacuum levels on each cup to give feedback direct to the operator about what's going on as it's walking. So we've got visual indication mm -hmm. of how, how well the vacuum levels are being achieved. So Chris, well, I think what, all of us are what, pretty... What, Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Alan. Well, no, I was mine, just was just, ask... mine was just nonsense. I was going to make a James Bond joke. <laughs> <laughs> I think you like that. I'm just... yeah. <laughs> so what technology, what is all of the technology in that basic robot frame? What's all in that case? So we've got um, a little onboard computer, which uh, controls the systems of the robot. But actually, a majority of the, the, the space of the robot is space. And that has really? been designed as our payload platform. So that's our loading bay for our tools. So the robot is essentially designed to give us um, space within the robot that we can mount a variety of different inspection or repair tools within it. So there's not a lot in, of stuff actually inside the robot, apart from a few like PCBs and power distribution boards um, and a small brain uh, to control things. But a majority of the area within the, within the, the robot is just avoid for things <laughs> so so how do you actually change tools so say you send up there with one tool um and then you're like hey we're gonna, when you're we're gonna pivot and do a different type of thing i'm sure obviously right now you're probably focused on we're going up to do one type of thing like you said you like you did your lightning uh receptor inspection but is there a time in the future where it's like we're gonna do x y and z we're gonna scan this thing we're gonna fix this thing we're gonna do that i mean is there a system is that where the human has to come in um and you know feed it the new tool or is there some way to, I mean, how, how does the whole tooling system work? That, that's really interesting to me. Yeah. So I think it's going to come in stages. So initially when we're still requiring people, um, we, we, I think we require people on site at the moment, so we can't go, um, without people, but we actually need them at the moment for, for, for operating the robot. So the swapping the tools over will be a manual process initially, but it is essentially like a modular platform that we can just take the lid off swap the LPS mm -hmm. probe out for an ultrasonic um, inspection device and away you go and you've, you've changed the, the tool set of the robot and its functionality. Going ahead, um, that is something that I can imagine being automated. So you can imagine having a suite of tools, the robot can pick and choose what it needs for a, for a specific task. If it's been uh, requested to do a specific task on a blade, it can go choose the right um, tool set and go and perform that task. And what we're doing at the moment, we're doing things in stages. So um, the robot is capable of inspection, maintenance and repair, but we're focusing on the inspection stuff 
um, now. So we, we've got those elements working. And the idea being that we're using existing tools that exist that are used wildly by the, widely by the industry and just adapting them to be used remotely by our robot. So the results we get don't need to be questioned. You know, we're using exactly the same equipment that the rope access mm -hmm. stations use. We're just using it remotely. Um, we're also actively working on a repair site, but that is a little bit more bespoke. So we're working on developing our uh, more of a bespoke modular set of tool sets for that. But it's, it's a case of where we can, tools exist already. So let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's just adapt them and make them work on our robot remotely and, and just make everyone's life easier. If you've got these tools, mm. you know, they can be used already on our robot without um a, a, any real problem yeah because i you know in my mind you know like there's some of these amazing cnc machines where you know within this whole cabinet you know it'll pick the pick the first tool swap out the bit swap out the bit and just continues to do it's like i mean it's an amazing like symphony of um but i mean do you see something like that maybe like down the road where you like you said you can just the the bot has a certain amount of things that it can do on its own with and then there's obviously others for that require human intervention Definitely. I think there's there's definite repetitive tasks on blades that you know, you know, the certain tools you're going to be using for and they can be selected automatically. And w with the repair side, we're, we're taking the approach of a more proactive um, repair strategy. So not waiting for damage on blades to get to a level where it warrants sending a rope access crew. You know, if you start seeing lead and edge erosion, for example, at an early stage, Treat it then. Treat it when it's really easy to treat, when it's quick, when you don't have those aerodynamic losses, you're not getting those impacts on your um, annual energy production. You're not going to get these huge uh, repair campaigns. So that's the philosophy that's taken. So the size of the robot is um, size that it can easily fit outside of the, the hatches of the roof of the nacelles, for example. It's a couple of pelly cases that an individual can use. So it's quite a small device. But actually, in terms of what it can do, it's it's so capable. And we're not talking about doing the big major repair campaigns. We're talking about the early stage repairs and the minor things that actually mm -hmm. the rope access technicians don't particularly enjoy doing because it's a lot of paperwork for them. It's quite boring. It's monotonous. <laughs> for, for a robot, yeah. monotony isn't a problem. Yeah. Um, it's more than happy mm -hmm. just to carry on doing <laughs> stuff. So, can, Chris, can you explain how the ultrasonic inspection works with your robot? Because I think that technology is really uh transformative in the sense that I, I think the way your robot is set up that you can almost get a ultrasonic scan like you would in the factory or on the ground but you can probably do it on turbine so can you explain how that process works and what that looks like sure so again we're not uh, we're not developing the the equipment we're using industry standard tools right. and so we right. effectively mount the the ut probe um within the robot the robot goes to the area of interest that wants to be scanned and then the robot body itself controls the probes to scan over the surface so we'll deliver the couplant um, and we'll scan that area collect that data and then that data can be analyzed and understood so um so it's quite apt that you mentioned cnc because the way that we control the robot is effectively like a cnc we can control mm -hmm. um the body position in, in a very accurate way so we can control how that probe is scanned so we can you know perform c scans on blade surfaces and understand exactly what's going on at the areas that are of potential damage or if there's any manufacturing defects for example um, so we can go there and scan it without the need of a human going there so i'm curious to hear about your time with ore catapult so you know they've they're a, a pretty interesting like sort of tech innovator obviously in the in the wind industry they've got that demonstrator um and we've heard really great things about them um obviously with any technology company like yours there's just it, it takes time right you have to put the the r d hours in you have to have great engineers like it's just not going to be a quick right out the door process um how how important have they been to your company's growth and the development of the of the blade bug they've been essential i would say so um i approached the ore catapult when it was just a concept and a few mock-up designs that i'd made in a in a shed and i sort of said this is what i want to make this is the, i've got this idea and they were like this is really interesting we've got people asking for solutions like this so they were able to firstly install confidence that actually pursuing this isn't um a bad idea is you know there, there are people mm -hmm. wanting it and it's it's a very valid approach to take and secondly they've been able to support every stage of development so from a single vacuum cup i've been able to test on wind turbine blades and validate every part of the robot 
Okay, it lets it let you leapfrog is what it did. I mean, it gets you access to, mm. to tools and to facilities you couldn't otherwise have access to. That's, that's a, such a huge advantage for you. Yeah, so they give us access to all the tools and facilities that we would really struggle to get on otherwise. Well, I mean, there's other... The Ori Catapult, as I understand it, is is an organization that's trying to promote the industry, right? So do they act as a... Yeah, yeah. Is there a sounding board there? Like you, you try this thing, and then they come back with feedback from the different uh, OEMs, and like we need the robot to do this. There's elements of that, but what they do have, they've they've got a lot of market knowledge already. So they have forums mm. where they speak to owners and operators of wind farms, and they they hear it from the horse's mouth the problems that wind turbines are experiencing, and and you know problems with the blades. So they have um, they're able to sort of. Um, transmit that information sort of anonymously because obviously it's still proprietary but they can say these are the problems that have been experienced and you know they are looking for solutions that are going to make uh life easier for them it's going to reduce their costs going to increase efficiency so it, it it very much helps steer or give confidence that the direction that you're you're working in is the right one that when you achieve your goals there'll be customers there who are willing to take it and it, they've mm. you know it goes beyond that where they've introduced us to a lot of um, owners, operators, independent service providers, and we've been able to engage in really early stage discussions um, to, again, to v validate the, the concept at an early stage so we don't go down the, the wrong road and spend a lot of time developing something that nobody wants. Uh, that's a gigantic advantage in terms of, one, limiting the amount of spins you're going to do on the design of the robot because you don't want to spend money where it's not going to be effective for the end user. And two, I, I think it's really hard to get unfiltered information from the wind turbine manufacturers. They are, it always gets sort of filtered through a sales group or through some management group. So you don't actually hear the the real information um, of, of what's happening out there. So to get all that information at one time and unfiltered is a huge advantage because when you're trying to bring a product to market, you know how difficult that can be. That Ori catapult just kind of leapfrogs you to that place, right? And is 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 that uh, an internal UK focus then? Is that is it mostly UK focus in terms of UK offshore uh, focus for Catapult that and then that's where your direction has been? Or how, how have they sort of kind of molded your company to be uh, useful and, and productive in the next year or two in terms of actually making measurements on blades? I mean, I think it, it fundamentally is is kind of UK focused just because of the way it's, it's funded through um, the UK government. But it's it's with the big picture that actually offshore wind isn't limited to one country or one region it's a global um market now we've seen the forecasts um for the us as you know in particular you know exploding over the sort of next 10 years so the idea being that if if we've got such a good resource at the moment in the uk that if we can use this as a concept proving ground then actually the the world is our oyster, so to speak. It, it's, it can be developed and applied elsewhere. But what this does give us is the ability to um, validate and, and, and show uh, how the rope performs and give us a sort of uh, a non-biased opinion and, you know, give, give the market an honest uh, approach to, to, to what companies are doing within this sector. And to have the information from the owners and operators and, and from wind farm manufacturers is is just it's such an essential thing that we would really struggle to get that sort of clarity of data otherwise yeah i mean because this seems like one of those technologies where the big companies like you said they are probably pretty aware that this is the future right robotics in general the drones i mean all the automotion all the automation for inspections repairs all that and so you wonder when there's new technologies like yours do these companies want to say, oh, let's we'll wait and see, because that's going to hurt the long term development of that in the industry. Right. Or if it's like, hey, we need to support these endeavors because we do want to see robotics take you know a major role in keeping workers safe and, you know, eliminating rope access to as much of a degree as they can because of safety issues. And just um, so, I mean, have you found that this sort of helps to bridge that gap where big companies are like, we want this to happen? And therefore, you know, with ORE and just, you know, we're, we know they're focusing on the right thing. So therefore, when these new technologies, even though they're in their infancy, we feel comfortable supporting them and going in. Because if everyone's like, ah, we're, you know, 
maybe in five years, then it just will, it'll never get going, right? It'll never happen, right? So this is this is where the Uri Catapult really um, shines for us. So we've had so much positive feedback from you know OEMs and, and owners and operators, but in order for us to get on their wind turbine, it's a big leap for them to have the confidence to put this, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, sure. this weird looking multi legged robot on their blade. But we can show them by having demonstrated it on uh, the catapults facilities that it's safe to do so, and without that um that bridge between the two it would be so much more difficult for us to to actually um show what we can do in order to give you know the owners and operators uh, the the confidence to go okay we'll we'll give you a, a, a you know we can you can pilot trial on, on ours which is what we're hoping to do sort of later this year but i think mm-hmm. it would be so much more difficult without having to demonstrate it over the last you know, we've been working with the catapult now for for over three years, and the the data that we've collected that we can show um, end users, we just wouldn't be able to have that before. And and so, yeah, they they bridge a gap that I don't know how we would bridge it otherwise. Yeah, because the drone thing was, you know, that was like a no brainer, right? And that's becoming more and more prevalent every single day. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, they're just flying around; they're not touching the turbine, which I, you know, I feel like that's what you've mentioned as being one of the hangups. We're like. We don't really want to put this on there unless we're pretty confident that it's safe and it's not going to. Yeah, that that just seems like that that crazy chicken and egg problem that you hear a lot of founders and inventors have. Where like, I know the solution makes sense, but they won't try. You know, like, uh, or even like the, in the job the job market, it's like, well, how can I get job experience if no one will hire me because I have no job experience? Right? That's like your blade right. bug. Your blade bug is just like going door to door. Exactly. Let me let me work on your turbine. They're like, oh, once you've worked on a turbine, you can work on a turbine. Exactly. It's like, oh, okay. okay. Right. Today, we take the drones as being second nature, but there was an evolution of drones that happened over five, six year time period to get to the point where they're at today, why would we not have the same sort of uh, uh, development process with robots we're going to? But those early acceptors, those early innovators that were willing to try something new are the ones that are going to win in that situation long term. And you have to be able to think outside the box a little bit once in a while, particularly on blade maintenance. And this is where these the robot movement is going to really take effect, I think, over the next probably this year and into 2022, is that we're over that initial infancy stage where it feels weird. It's normal. We're starting to use robots in a lot of different areas around the world for all different kinds of products. Why not wind turbines? And I think, Chris, you, you got a, really got a leg up, I think, in, in a sense, because you, you put the work in when things have been relatively quiet during COVID times. You just accelerated your programs. And I think you're ready. And I think this summer is going to be really interesting for you. Yeah, this summer, this summer's, um, this year already is, is, is going at a rate of knots that I can't quite comprehend. And this summer, if, if some of the things that we've got in the pipeline, um, come to fruition, it's going to be really exciting, um, for what we can achieve and, and sort of show the market what we can do. So let, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, um, wind technicians and controlling the robot. So, um, we you know we've had this discussion a, a bunch, Alan and I recently, um, how do you see the future of the wind turbine technician job? I mean, do you feel like them using lots of different robotics is going to be just sort of like par for the course, just like a, a carpenter uses a, you know, a power drill and a saw? Um, and how, I mean, you've mentioned your robot being physically complex. You know, there's a lot of moving parts, but it's actually really, really simple to use. So what's the learning curve like uh, for someone who's going to use a blade bug and what does the jobs market look like for wind turbine techs? And how does how does their their skill set need to evolve going forward? So I think that there'll always be a requirement for for rope access technicians. There'll always be damage to blades that the robot it's just too complex to have a robot that can solve those things. So there'll always be a need for for you know for the highly skilled rope access technicians. What our robot affords is you can upskill the technicians that are performing uh, the maintenance on turbines already. And with minimal training, they will be able to perform a number of tasks you currently have to have a, a skilled rope access crew to perform. So if you wanted to check the lightning protection system of a blade, if you wanted to um, tackle early stage lead and edge erosion, you suddenly can have your technician who is, is looking after the drivetrain, for example, who's now able to perform work on the blades, but actually not 
having to go out onto the blade face to do that. Hmm. So we see it as a as a general upskilling of the technicians that are there with the with the premise that actually the overall goal is to improve wind farms or wind turbines on a whole. So the overall goal is to make them better to improve the levelized cost of energy, to capture as much energy as you possibly can. And by taking this more proactive approach that you can do with the robot, with people that you have out um, on site anyway, it just gives you that more opportunity to, to do those tasks. If, if, for example, there's a drop in the wind and you, there's something that you've seen, oh, we can maybe tackle that now without the impact of, you know, having to shut down your turbine for a big campaign. You can just do things in a very opportunistic approach with technicians who essentially it is just another tool for them. The robot is a tool that can be just taken out of a case and utilized for mm -hmm. a job at hand. Yeah, that's really interesting to think that, you know, one technician could go up and say, all right, I've got this list of things to do today. Here goes robot A, here goes robot B. You guys have your things. I'm going to go do this. And then you just kind of monitor. It's almost like he's the supervisor or she's the supervisor. And they're just new members to the crew. I mean, is that kind of how you conceptualize it? <laughs> I think so, yeah. And especially it's worth pointing out that the dexterity of the robot means that we're not limited to just external blade inspection. So there's a whole raft of areas on a, on a turbine that are awkward to get to. So internal blade inspections, for example, and, and work within oh. the tower and around the nacelle. And our robot is actually capable of performing a variety of tasks. So we could be doing things concurrently. So if, if work is going on in the nacelle, for example, then the robot could perform in other tasks or, you know, it just enables a lot more work to be done or bookend together. So you're trying to really optimize your time when you're working on a turbine if you've got it shut down for a specific task. And then specifically, you said the, the Bladebug can be controlled by an Xbox controller. Is that is that right? Yeah, so we, we just use a, we, we use an Xbox controller for, for a number of reasons. One, um, the engineers that we have, um, it's a very well-designed controller with lots of buttons. And mm. we need that ability to change uh, options for the robot to do different things. And it's just a very well-designed, comfortable, ergonomic thing to use. So again, this is trying to utilize why try and reinvent something which has already been designed right. very well <laughs> um, and robust. And, and it's so familiar to so many people. Yeah. So they can hold it and it feels natural. It feels normal to, to, to operate. You're not trying to instill a new method of operating a robot. It's just, it's almost like playing a game. Well, I feel like you need to build in some cheat codes, like in the Teslas, or you know, left, right, left, right, up, down, A, B, C, and then like does a backflip on the on the on the blade. You joke, but I'm pretty sure they exist in in the code already. So, uh... <laughs> oh my and gosh. then long term, um, how do you see these getting up there? So right now, they need to be hoisted up, you know, through the tower, um, or, or take me through the process of how you get a blade bug up one to the blade. Because I we've talked about this before. My long-term vision, because, you know, we need to continue to keep to, we can't make everything robotic. So I feel like we should, you know, use bald eagles, condors, train these creatures and keep them, you know, we don't want them to get too idle, but, you know, mixed nature here. So we throw it on a condor's back. It takes it within the cell. Anyway. I'm um, taking notes. I'm taking notes. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It means a lot. Um, but how do they get up there? I mean, is there is there a potential in the future where a drone flies it up into place? Where again, you kind of have like this symphony of of um, different uh, technologies. Exactly that. So at the, at the current first port of call that we've gone to is is what we're trying to do is so complex anyway. We're not trying to develop another method of of getting onto blade. So we yeah. we have rope access technicians who assist the robot currently. Um, this is mainly just for in case something goes wrong because we're still in the development stages really and so we utilize the we, we get it out on top of the hatch it gets uh, wheeled to the front of the the spinner lower down and attaches to the blade in the future there's so many different methodologies so um offshore um for example it's different to how we could do it onshore so at onshore you've got different areas that you know there's different methods that you could use which you haven't got the ability to do offshore because you've got no land around you. So to get it onshore, there's different approaches um, to offshore. But in the future, um, and actually we, we, we're working on er elements of this at the moment, it, it is about drone deployment. So the whole premise being getting to and from that point of interest as quickly as possible. And um, it's one area that we're, we're working on and one area that we see as, as, as a possible um, significant game changer in, in, in how we'll be able to perform um, these tasks on blades. 
Yeah, well, what does the business look like two or three years from now? Is the goal to sell robots to repair companies, to sell robots to the OEMs, to sell robots to the owners? Are they going to try to, de- are you thinking about deploying a robot per turbine? Uh, what does that look like? Is it like a lease structure, a rent structure, a sales structure? On the business side, what is that proposed model look like? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above, really. So we are we are fundamentally, we're a robotics company. We're not looking at becoming a service arm. Um, I think initially we'll be doing elements of that, and, you know, just to get it into people's hands. We'll be showing and demonstrating. But sure. the idea is very much to, to sell or lease the robot to the owners, operators, to the OEMs, and to the independent service providers. Because it's it's going to be a mixture of the three essentially um the oems often have long term service agreements with the owners and operators and so we can either sell it to them or to the independent service providers which are often contracted or subcontract subcontracted out by those oems to perform the specific um say blade related tasks mm-hmm. um but what we're also seeing is owners and operators becoming a lot more um aware of their assets and a lot more aware of their blades in particular and so they're not just necessarily taking the uh, you know the feedback from uh, an independent service provider they want to double check and actually make sure that what they've been told is correct and so we see um all three of those sectors as as being customers of ours and either working together or you know just sort of comparing um results from say another process or method that's being used um to generate data for them so, Chris, in terms of the robots and how it's going to be installed, are you are you envisioning one robot per turbine or one robot per site? What what are the thought? What's the thoughts around that? I, I think ideally it would be resident robots per per turbine, um, able to perform like tasks as and when is required. But the other vision as well is is sort of like a fleet of robots on a wind farm, which can be deployed. Uh, from like a central hive or from like a central um, point within the wind farm that they're able to be deployed readily and available, you know, to to the blades as and when it's required, really. So you're saying like a, a, a robot would basically, it just stays with that turbine and when they need to do something, it, it just does its thing, just like in like a, having a toolbox at the site? Exactly, yeah. Hmm. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Because I think right now yeah. everyone thinks of, you got to call someone, they got to bring it over, and they got to do all their thing. And I think that is, in, in a lot of ways, like what you do with a drone company or whatever. But that right. idea of having at a site, there's just a team of drones, a team of robots, and then a team of humans that's going to help do it all, you know, get them, get them all, you know, make sure they're not slacking off, sleeping in too late, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's an interesting concept where... They're just I mean, there and, and use them when you need to use them. I mean, especially offshore, you, you know, the, the turbines are getting yeah. so large and so isolated from from shore that actually one of the biggest risks and costs is that it's getting to and from the turbine. So if you don't, if you can mitigate that by not having to do that, then I think that's that's another avenue that we're very keen to sort of explore and understand. Oh, sure. Sure. I, I think that makes a lot total logical sense because it, particularly in the United States and offshore of UK, obviously, uh, the number of turbines we're going to be install, uh, installing off the eastern coast of the United States is going to be in the thousands. Uh, so there's just no way that you can maintain that unless you have one robot per turbine. You're just going to need it. So is is there a data cloud piece to this business because of all the information that's going to be coming off these robots and all the sensors? How does How does that data get managed? Yeah, so the data is is one thing that is is really interesting. It, it's something that um, we're aware that there's so many different data systems out there and, and management platforms that we've taken the conscious decision that we're not going to be developing our own blade bug data management system off the bat. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. the, w- what we will do is make a very easy to transfer. So we'll be uh, uh, able to transfer the data really easily to any one of those those data platforms that exist already with the idea of being that more data is better. So if you have more data, you can make more informed decisions about your assets. And so we'll right. just make a very simple API interface to, to put our data into the system. And so you've just got a better set of data sets for each blade or for each turbine or for wind farm. And 
it just helps make decisions um, more informed and make the right choice at the end of the day. Um, so that's how we see ourselves as a, we'll be collecting the data, but we'll just be passing it on to, um, mm. you know, the relevant uh, data right. structures that exist in place already. And how networkable uh, are the robots? Like, can you control the robot from, like if there's a robot in Iowa in, in the United States, are you able to control the robot from the UK? Is it, networkable in that sense uh, you can access it via the internet or do you have to be on site on site um, I, I mean in theory it's it's networkable so we but that is one of the the key benefits that we'll be able to perform uh, tasks remotely with experience from afar so for the uh, for the non-destructive testing for example the ultrasonics if you wanted to get live data from an NDT expert, they wouldn't necessarily have to be on site. They could be sitting in their office in the warm surrounds on shore and analyze that data there and then without having to be there. So that that is one of the, the ways that we see the robot being operated in the future for sure. So does that essentially set you up as a global business from the start, right? Because if you have the ability to talk to a robot remotely that may be running into a little bit of difficulty in terms of what they're trying to measure or that you want to pull data off and have somebody look at that data immediately because you want to get a repair done the next day. That functionality and that uh, interconnectivity doesn't just really explode the business in a sense and that it can be used anywhere, anytime, and that there's always someone to call or someone that, that can connect up and help with problems that exist in the field? Um, it does. I think w when we started, I think we... we... I think our approach to this is, is is sort of the UK is our entry market just because it's it's sure. close to home. Um, sure. But actually, the the market itself is global, and the owners and operators are aren't necessarily geographically defined to countries and regions. So um, we expect that once we go commercial, that um, mm -hmm. it will it well fingers crossed it, it will explode sort of. Well, not, not the robot yeah. mode, but that the the market will explode for <laughs> us on a world being cut that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I think but, that, I think that's got to happen, right? That, that's that's yeah. an a, a eventuality you have to plan for because I do think that's where you're headed. And in terms of a sort of a company standpoint, then how do you prepare for that? You, you kind of know that's coming. How do you prepare for that internally? So you when you're getting phone calls from Brazil or Central America or you know people like us in the United States. How do you handle all that? Because I, I do think that's coming for you. Yeah. So this is this is one of the things we've we've just secured our first um, investment uh, equity, our first private equity investment, um, and we're doing a much larger one later on in the year. And again, yeah. it's the, the the investment is for that ramp up for commercial activity. So it is growing the team, getting the right people with the experience in the right place. Um, sure. As you say, we're going to have to very, very quickly shift from a sort of R and D approach where it's been, you know, we've got time to develop things to you've got customers on the line calling with right. problems, or and we need to have those. We we basically need to have uh, more resource to, to deal with that. So we're looking at um, raising in order to facilitate the growth of the business to to cover those areas. And that seems really complex to go from, you know, uh, what I assume is just like a bespoke robot where you're probably manufacturing a lot of these complex parts seeing and you know cnc machining them in house to suddenly scaling that up and i mean that it's probably going to require a lot of tooling and you know i mean do you manufacturing guys, yeah is that something that seems like a really scary step like you said it's going to need a lot of money and a lot of the right people um to get to that you know like that mass production stage yeah so it's it, one of those things that we've been again with the with things like the redundancy in the robot it's also been designed with elements of design for manufacture so it is mm -hmm. prototype but it's it's you know we could manufacture these prototypes essentially in in small batch volumes um without too much sure. pain before having to do a sort yeah. of uh redesign for sort of mass manufacture so that has been designed knowing that actually this 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 uh, version of the robot that we've got currently might be the one that we have to produce you know a number of and so whilst it's not fully sure. refined for manufacture it's it's definitely that is a, yeah. an option for sure yeah and that, that's that's i feel like that's a really interesting problem because probably at first you're like we just want to get this to do what we want it to do we don't care how we get it to do it right you just make the parts that make it work and then after, as it starts to go you have to say okay well 
the way we made this one part is just not going to be feasible for, you know, any kind of scale. So how can we change that? And was there, a, I assume there was a lot of that in the early stages. 100%. Yes, there's, there is lots of that. And to be honest, there's probably some of that still um, in the design of the current robot. Um, and this goes to, again, the investment to get the right people on board, or there are external companies that specialize in, in turning prototypes into uh, manufacturable design. So it's mm. about finding the right people to get them either in-house or get the resources in order that we can facilitate uh, uh, external companies to to take that design to the next sort of stage for us. I think one of the big things with the wind industry that's interesting is that everything seems to be one of... Everyone wants to make everything to last, right? You want to, if you install anything on a blade, you want it to last 20 years, which seems to make sense. Everyone likes buying quality, whether it's in your home, whether it's your, your vehicle, we want everything to last a long time. But if we get to the point where you can repair and replace things really, really easily and cheaply, is that going to actually have the opposite effect where some of these maybe like power curve upgrades where you could, you know, put vortex generators on a blade. Um, rather than having to make them super robust and this really rigorous installation progress or process so they last 10 years, if you could just do it so easily by deploying a robot and, you know, one person controls it that they could do it every two years, you could make them cheaper. And, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, do you see, do you see that sort of opposite trend maybe happening in the future where repairs become less costly, easier, faster to the point where they can spend less and have more almost like disposable sort of repair and replacement options. Yeah, I don't I don't necessarily like the term disposable in the sense that I think things should be designed well. Um, but I, what I do see as a benefit is, for example, if you design something now, in 10 years time, that'll be outdated. There might be mm -hmm. uh, a step change in vortex generator design or something like that. So if mm. you're able to have that ability to change things really easily and cheaply, um, yes, it means you can design things potentially for a shorter time scale, but with the idea being that you're not replacing like for like, you're replacing it with a with a with an upgrade of an upgrade. So things can be improved along the way. So when you do go back to do your simple install, you're actually doing more than just uh, you know replacing your vortex generators. You're putting an improvement on, which again, the whole ethos of of making wind turbines uh, better at what they do sort of helps and uh with the lead and edge repair for example i think whilst the holy grail is a is a one-time solution i think we're far from that and i think the reality is that blades need to be um, maintained regularly they are in a very harsh environment they perform an incredible job and i just don't think it's that much of a problem if you, if you need to repair them every couple of years if you can do that mm -hmm. very quickly and easily using a you know a device our device in particular um to do that yeah, that makes sense. It's such an interesting thing to think about because, like I said, everyone wants to go quality, repair the leading edge for forever, right? Coat it in granite so it's never going to happen again. Um, but the opposite, like you said, I think that's a really interesting idea that if we get to the point where there's nothing there's nothing wrong, it's not a big deal to just work on them every, every so often. And that's just like part of it, just like any other thing. Don't you think, Dan, it's like general maintenance? And we haven't thought about wind turbine blades in that way. In fact, there's a lot of research and uh, meetings and conferences talking about making blades last 20 years and the, and the difficulty in doing that and the, and the added cost that's going to be involved in that. I do think the other option is, and probably the more efficient cost-wise option, is to provide general repairs and to keep on it. But the the cost the, the cost driver right now is just having three technicians on site, particularly offshore, mm -hmm. and the cost of that versus something robotic, which can do most of those repairs and just and, and keep the technology and the cost of the blades relatively stable, which is a, a, a barrier to entry is, is the price of blades. So keeping those blade costs relatively stable over time, but then adding that discrete element of robotics and low cost, repetitive repairs uh, to maintain the blade through the lifetime. I think what you're going to see, Chris, is that the the operators are going to have a schedule. Like when they buy a wind turbine, they're going to have a schedule of when they're going to be doing these repairs. They're going to know it because they've accumulated the data and they're going to know at year five, I want to put on vortex generators. Uh, at year seven, uh, I may want to do a leading edge repair and just build it into the model, build it into the cost yeah. model. But the, mm -hmm. the driver right now is, the, is that unknown cost of the, of the so the technicians of how bad it's gonna be versus a robotic option, which opens up all sorts of opportunities to lower costs and provide a more consistent result. Uh, I, I don't see how that doesn't work. 
right? I think I, I think that's that's why you're such in a sweet spot right now is that that industry, this whole industry, is going to evolve into your technology. Do you see it happening that way, or I do? So I think. Uh, about 75% of the work on blades is, is unplanned maintenance. And I would like right. to flip that on its head. So it's 75% planned maintenance. And that just makes mm. life, that makes yeah. budgeting, that makes forecasting so much easier. And so if you if you change that around and you just know exactly, you know, each year or every two years, you're just going to be, as you say, general maintenance on your blades. They are, you know, they're the engine of the of the turbine. You just want to look after them. And there's, I don't think there's mm. any harm in saying that, that you need to give them a bit of care and attention and then not just leave them for 20 years and expect them to be performing at the same level as when they were originally installed. Yeah, and I think you're right also in the, in the sense that over that 20-year lifespan, there's going to be other aerodynamic improvements. You know, Nicholas Godern at Power Curve and all the other wind turbine aerodynamics companies are always come with these new technologies you're going to be able to improve that over time and it's just part of the process like why would you want to try to design the ultimate blade when you know over the 20 year lifespan you're going to be able to get more aep out of it anyway because everybody's working on it so the ro robot provides that platform to increase the blade efficiency over the lifetime which is unheard of but i think that's the only way it happens don't you see it happening kind of that way i do yeah <laughs> yeah well and yeah. there's corollaries everywhere i mean I was having this conversation a couple of years ago because I, I am still I'm a, an advocate of, of leasing cars in a lot of situations because I was like, mm. why would I want to buy a car today in 2019 when in five years the car might drive me around? It might be, you know, like electric. Right. I mean, like technology is changing so fast. Like, why would I want to own uh, like a, even like a, a new camera or a computer? Like they're changing so fast where it doesn't make sense yep. to me to buy a $5,000 top of the line camera when in two years for half the price, you're going to get more than that. Like it's, it's, it's crazy. And like you said, it's, right. it's the same thing where what you install on the blade today might pale in comparison to something just three years from now, where it makes sense to just spend a little bit and wait and then get the next upgrade and get the next upgrade rather than like you said, try to design the penultimate thing today and for the yeah. future, because technology is changing so fast. Yeah, we're never going to get there in the ultimate blade. There'll never be an ultimate blade. And I think the the technology, and we should have learned something from just watching general industry, like the automotive industry. I think Tesla's sort of doing that same thing where a lot of upgrades are just software. The fundamentals are all there, but to improve the efficiency of the of the vehicle is a software upgrade. I think the similar thing exists here and, and sort of robot robots and robot repair is that software upgrade over time. It will be. And I think when as we get closer to that um, being reality, and I think, 2021, 2022 is going to be those years. Uh, I think our, the owners and operators are going to be really conscientious of that. And I know, um, you know, like Bjorn Hedges and other people we've talked to over the time are are definitely thinking that way. They're they're thinking out of the box a lot. Uh, it's just making that transition, and, and hopefully this year for Chris is the year that things really get going. Yeah, fingers crossed. And again, the upgrades is an interesting, not just for Blaze, but for the robot as well. The fact that we've designed it in this modular system, it's yes. not, it's not this, this is it. You know, the mm -hmm. tools are completely upgradable. If new tools or sensors come to market, it's very easy to upgrade the robot. It's, it, right. I wouldn't say it's future proof by any means, but it's definitely got oh. elements of that, that we can make it. It, yeah. It's very easy to bring up to date with, you know, simple either software advances, which we'll be doing, or with different hardware or tool sets that come sure. uh, to market. And really what we have seen, actually, is, is lots of interest from people who have tools ready and waiting to go and need a device such as ours to use them or mm. uh, remotely. Oh, sure. So we see, you know, that we see that the tool set becoming such a uh, one of the key elements of this, where it is, uh, you know, new things will keep on being uh, ready to be used for, via the Blade Bug robot. Well, and you'll probably have that effect where, you know, there's the early adopters who some people are leery and some people are like, yes, you know, let's do it. Let's be an early adopter. But then what? So shortly after that, it's like everyone else is like, oh, crap, this is a really proven thing and we're behind like how can we we, we got to right. catch up we got to catch up right where every you know like if you're you're a, a repair company and down the street your competitor has a whole fleet of robots you're like you know we got to get up to speed so you probably <laughs> see that like you know exponential growth at some and point we're, we're seeing that so speaking to like to, to say drone companies in particular um there there are so many drone companies out there that they now wanted to try and differentiate themselves 
And one way they can differentiate themselves is by offering more than just a visual inspection. So if you can offer a sort of more of a turnkey service where you do the inspection and be able to follow up with the detailed inspection and repair, that makes you stand out more from your competitors. And so I think you're right. I think the early adopters are the ones who are going to significantly benefit from, you know, um, taking that that step into the uh, more advanced technology that's, that's coming. Well, and just learning how to do it, to, you know, as well, like, because it, it's going to take a whole team to get on board. Technicians are going to have to get comfortable with it. There's going to be a, you know, a, a, some growing pains and a learning curve with, you know, what can we do? Where is it better? Like, just how do we, it, it doesn't seem like a quick thing. It's not like just grabbing a new, you know, swapping your Milwaukee for a Makita, you know, drill. It's, <laughs> it, there's going to be a lot of things. It's like you said, it's almost like integrating a new team member onto your team more than just like a handheld power drill. So to have the whole yeah. systems and everything up and running would take some time where it seems like being that early adopter would make, would get you just, again, just get you ahead of the curve. And exactly. And it's about getting the right early adopters, the early adopters that are aware of the, the shortcomings of, of the sort of prototype robot. So if things don't necessarily go 100% right, which I'm sure they're not going to go every time, that it, that it's not a black mark against you. It's just, this is a learning curve and you can see the end goal. And mm-hmm. it's having it's having no, that, that sort of friendly um, early adopter approach where they, they're there to help and not to just sort of Oh well, that didn't do exactly as it was meant to do. So that that's yeah. that. Yeah, we're we're looking for those and and finding a few of those at the moment, which is really exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people who want it to work and they they understand that it's not going to be yeah. perfect at first. They need it to mm-hmm. work, right? I mean, I, I think the accountants and the on the operations side of the wind turbines need this to work because it's going to lower the overall cost of of providing electricity, and that's where everybody's going. So, you know, a lot of times we get. Uh, I'm one of the at fault of this all the time. Engineering side, side, this is really cool, and you know this is where it's going, but a lot of times it's the accountants that are driving what happens next, and once, and I know this is going to happen, once Chris shows that this is going to save them money over time, this is a slam dunk. You know, when, when you get into a boardroom and they say, can we save a half million dollars, a million dollars a year in, in sort of downtime, yeah, uh, that's a no-brainer, right? And that's that's where it's the flood is going to come. So those early adopters are really critical, right? But once the accountants figure out that there's uh, money to be had, then it just explodes, and and that's where this is going. There's no doubt about that. Exactly, and I think if it doesn't save money, that that's that is the problem. So, despite the health yep. and safety benefits, it, it does come down to numbers at the end, and, and people will want to see that cost benefit of of uh, the robot and. Right. I, th- I think that's, you know, one of the, the, the sort of the key features here as we go forward for any robotic company, you have to make it financially worth your while. There's a lot of cool technology, but if it doesn't pr- return, provide a return on investment, then it's not worth that initial investment. I think robots are going to show themselves to be worth that investment. That's not even really a discussion point right now. It's just getting some data on the books or the the accountant types can and the business types can look at that and go, yeah, okay, I, I see that I mm-hmm. cut my cost down. I see that I, I took shorter downtime. I, I see that my blades are better off long term, 10 years, 15 years down the line. Then then I think it, ex- it really ramps up in terms of robotics. Well, Chris, where can people follow up with you if they want to learn more about Bladebug, your company? Where can they find you on the web and on social media and all that? So yeah, we have um, bladebug.co.uk website where We'll be sort of posting updates. We have our LinkedIn, uh, which is always good for finding out what we're currently doing. That's probably one of our main social media um, outlets. We're, we're on Twitter as well. Um, just look for, for Blade Bug Limited uh, out there. But we'll be we'll be trying to do a big campaign going forward when we start um, releasing some more of the exciting stuff that we've been working on this year and getting out into the sort of public to get excited about as excited about it as we are so for everyone out there listening or watching you know we always put the links um to our guests uh you know website social media handles all that stuff in the uh, description below so whether you're on youtube itunes stitcher wherever just check out the description of the show and you can click right through uh to learn more about blade bug and yeah chris we definitely want to see more of the uh the video and stuff i mean you guys have such cool technology where and just the views from atop those things i mean come on it's, it's the best so we'll look yeah. forward to that but th- uh chris uh thanks again for coming on the show it was a great conversation we really appreciate your time pleasure thank you so much for for, for hosting me All right. Well, that's it for this episode of the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. want to thank again our guest, Chris Cheshlack from Bladebug. And be sure to subscribe to the show, 
follow up with blade bug on the web and share it with a friend you know great conversations like today deserve to be shared so we'll see you here next time on the uptime wind energy podcast Operating a profitable wind farm is all about mitigating costs, minimizing risks, and being efficient with maintenance, repairs, and upgrades. It's incredibly expensive to send a team of rope access technicians up tower to make even simple repairs. We also know how costly lightning damage can be, requiring inspection, repairs, and downtime for even minor lightning strikes. Maximize the time efficiency of your techs and prevent future lightning damage by installing our Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your crews are going up on ropes. Learn more in today's show notes or visit us on the web at weatherguardwind.com.